think it will be given during the Q and A session. So please do stay until the end to get your MyCSB points. So since everyone's here, uh, we should get started. Uh, a very warm welcome to Dr. Norsakina and also to all the participants who attend our physics coffee talk tonight. So today's uh, topic is about low level laser in the world of medicine. And in this talk, uh, we get to know about the low level laser, the basic principles of it, and also the very famous uh, eye surgery using laser, uh, which is known as LASIK treatment. So without any further delay, I would like to call Dr. Norsakina to give a talk. Thank you. Thank you, Shamini, and good uh, evening, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm shocked with the amount of attendance because normally for the coffee talk, we just have like a few people, right? Now we have about <laughs> 80. <yeah. laughs> All right, okay. Um, let me share the slides first. Can you see my slides? Mm, yes, doctor. Okay. Let me adjust this first because I can see like a bit of floating. Okay. Um, the topic given to me is basically about um, laser therapy. Um, just a little bit of introductions. So myself is Nur Sakina Swardi. Um, my research mainly is about um, low level laser therapy. Um, when you're talking about laser therapy, there is actually a high power laser therapy and low level laser therapy. So my research mainly um, a laser therapy. And um, by the way, I'm not a medical doctor, even though I use laser um, in, in medicine. So basically, I'm still um, a physicist um, and I did not actually contract a laser on my own. Um, so with my research, uh, mainly I use laser as a tool um, for a therapy. So um, I hope that today's sharing will just give you kind of like an introduction about what is a laser. Um, and it could be that most of the time when you talk about laser, it's always about the industry. So now we will get to know a little bit about um, how we apply this laser in, in medicine. Okay. Can you, can you hear my voice clearly? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Um, before we start, I just want to know, um, whether, I mean, like when, whenever we mention about uh, the term laser, what is actually the first thing that come across uh, in your mind? I just want to know um, what do you think about laser? Can you actually reply me in the chat box or you can just unmute yourself and then talk to me? I really hope this is really a coffee session where we can have like enjoying session, not like a formal lecture because it's the, the session itself called the coffee talk. Um, Star Wars. Uh, because of their uh, weapon that they use, okay. Electron, interesting. Laser for eye, okay. Laser treatment, become beautiful, okay. <laughs> it's very interesting. Um, okay, I would, I didn't want to answer you yet, but basically um, some of the people said that when you heard about terms of laser, you also re are reminded of um, the radiation, uh, and also like a cutting, and I think it's widely used for um, a beauty, a laser toy to ring it shop. Yes, um, if you go to Pasar Malam, right, the market shop, so most of the time you'll get like a very cheap laser to be used, and you used to kind of like shine, shine to other people, uh, the light. So, okay, most of you are familiar with the laser. Um, a brief introduction about the laser itself. So the names of laser, it's mean a light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. So you can see there are um, two important keys over here, which is light amplification. So it means like the light is actually amplified. And another one is the stimulated emission where you get the laser. So basically the laser is a device that generates the intense beam of the coherent, monochromatic and the collimated light by the stimulated emission of photons from the excited atoms of the molecules. So um, this actually was theorized by um, Albert Einstein in 1917. So from there, um, there is like a scientist that um, have used this kind of theory to actually um, into a stimulated emission and then um, get into the laser itself. 
Okay. Um, okay. I just like um, whenever I talk about something, I really love to know what is the history behind it. So this is actually how um, they discovered the laser. So the first things that we consider as a predecessor to the laser is the invention of the uh, maser, which is microwave amplification. So instead of light, you actually sort of like amplified electromagnetic waves um, in the range of the web, uh, microwave. So that's why you call it a microwave, microwave, microwave amplification. So this one is in 1954 uh, by this um, Charles Tons and also Arthur uh, Sholo. And then in 1960, and only you discovered um, a laser by the Thomas Mayman. So he uh, produced the first laser using a synthetic uh, ruby rod. So this is actually the first setup. And in fact, at that time, um, most of the researchers have used like millions of dollars to actually try to produce a laser based on this setup. However, um, the Thomas Mayman just kind of like use, um, how do I say, it's a little bit like cheaper types of the research. And then this is how he um, first produce the first laser using the ruby rod. And then in around the 1960s as well, so right after you got the laser, so Dr. Leon Goldman is the one that the father of medicine used um, the laser for a surgery. So this is um, the Dr. Leon Goldman, so we call it the father of laser medicine. So basically um, after the laser was discovered, um, so they've used in, in medicine for quite some time already. All right, let's get into the stimulation emission of the laser itself. So what is that? Okay, um, the first thing that, uh, as the name says over here, it's a stimulation, right? So you have to kind of like stimulate um, the atoms over here. So when you have a photons and then you strike this atom, so these atoms are going to absorb um, these photons and then you will actually induce a transition between, um, sorry, from the le lower levels to the upper levels over here. Right, so um, over here, we call it like a stimulation uh, absorption. So um, when the atom receives the photons, it will actually get excited and then travels uh, at the upper levels. And then in order for them to, most of the time, they will always like seek for the equilibrium, right? So normally they will actually decay and then goes back to the uh, lower levels because they cannot actually stay in, um, for a longer time at the uh, upper level. So they will actually decay. So as they decay, they will actually produce uh, photons could be in terms of light. And this is actually in the random rate direction. So this one, we call it a spontaneous emission. But what is interesting about laser is, so imagine that you have this um, atoms that's already excited at the excited stage, and then you actually um, make them interact with another photons. So from there, you will actually get, instead of just like one photons, you will actually have another two photons with the same direction. So this is what we call it a stimulated emission. So basically you kind of amplify. So from just like one just laser over here, uh, sorry, one light uh, photons over here. So one is actually decays when it goes down, so it will actually produce two. So this is how it's actually amplified. And from the sp spontaneous emission, this is how you get just the normal lights, like the lamp, right? So this is how you get um, the light, which is like uh, kind of like this, or we call it diverge. Why? For the laser, because um, the photon that's actually produced after later on is actually with the same phase, the same types of energy. So this is how we get the laser. And in order for us to maintain that, as you know that um, most of the, I'm mean, like normally, if you get, um, let me just scroll a bit. Normally, if you have like an atoms over here and then you, um, you will actually have a lot more um, atoms actually at the uh, lower ground from to the upper ground, right? So um, in order for you to keep on producing a laser, you, you want to sustain the laser light. So you have to make sure that you have a lot of amount of um, atoms at the excited states because that's how you produce a simulated emission. So this is called a population inversion. So it's sort of like inverse. So instead of you have a lot of atoms at the ground level, so you have a lot of atoms, excited atoms at the upper levels. So this is how you'll be able to actually um, get uh, the stimulated emission and then keep on amplify the, uh, the light. All right, so that's how the principle that we use in the producing laser and it comes to engineering of the laser. So how do we actually get um, this uh, laser who will actually continuously um, emit it? So this is the components that you can get in the laser. The first one is a lazy medium. 
where you get the atoms that can emit light uh, by the stimulated emission. And then you have the pumping system. So this pumping system is the source of energy to excite the atoms because you need the uh, atom to keep on excited. So And um, you need like a specific energy with the proper um, energy state actually to excite them. And in, in order for you to actually sustain, um, how do I say, the, the excitation and then the stimulated emission, so you need this optical resonator, which is um, done by the reflector mirror. So as um, the, the, the atoms actually keep on, you're actually making the atoms and also the photons keep on bouncing back and forth, back and forth. So, so that's how you sustain the excitation and then keep on um, having the lasers out. And then one is of the mirror is a fully reflecting, another one is a partially transmitted mirror. So this is a this allowed um, the laser to go out of the, um, the the laser housing itself. So that's how you get the laser. Okay, um, most of the people that are actually working on, I'm talking to them that I'm mean, use laser in my research, they kind of like confused. And what is really the difference between the laser and light? So most of the time, they'll just like perceive the same thing and even LED itself. So they will actually think that it's a similar thing. However, there is a difference from that. Um, would you like to actually answer me what is actually the difference between the laser and the light itself, like a normal lamp or even the LED? Can, can anyone answer in the chat box over here? Let's see, we have another question. Can anyone answer me? What is the difference between the laser light and, um, I mean, like the normal light itself? One got radiation, another one has. Okay. What else? Uh, doctors. Yes? Uh, I, I have an opinion, but I'm not sure if it's uh, correct. So uh, basically, light is like, a, a, you know, normally, classically, let's say, you know, light is, uh, in, in a classical sense, is white light, which is a mix of light. Over, okay. a ra uh, over a range of a radius, uh, over a range of uh, what do you call okay. Okay. Whereas, uh, whereas laser is uh, is kept as monochromatic as possible, which means that there's only one single wavelength and that there's always a direction that we want to point the, the light towards. So that, that's it. Yeah, that's a very good answer. I'll give you 100 if you were to answer the test. So that is a very good answer. Um, so basically, the difference between laser and light is um, how the laser light is, is very, um, how do I say, very monochromatic, and you only have a single wavelength. So if you have like a light, it's actually kind of like this pulse. So even, okay, with this um, images itself, you'll see that this is how the laser looks like, and it's very narrow, just like a single line. And you can even have a laser light just as small as, um, and uh, sorry, as thin as your your hair. That that's how you you, you can make the laser uh, beam is. While for the the light itself, you can see that it kind of like diverge, and you have a lot of wavelength, and then it just like go everywhere, kind of like randomly. While for the laser, you can actually point it um, very precisely and accurately. I can see over here, a specific wavelength laser is coherent, monochromatic. Yes, it is all correct. So this is how um, you did you differentiate between the laser uh, and the light itself. So you will have like many different wavelengths while for the laser beam you have a single wavelength. And for the ordinary light you have like a random uh, which is, is produced by spontaneous emission while for the laser itself because it's produced by the stimulated emission everything is actually in phase. So even the frequency is the same so everything is actually in the same. Um, all right, let's talk about the laser spectrum. Um, when I'm working with my research, the most important thing is choosing the right laser. Because um, if I use a wrong laser, I will get a different effects um, of the therapeutic things that I want. So in my research, I actually work into two things. The first one is the therapy itself. So that's why we call it low-level laser therapy. Another one, I use it for a cancer treatment. Um, in my research, which I have like a cancer cells, and then I try to use the low level laser to actually kill the cancer cells. So in choosing, um, I mean like the spectrum itself is very important to make sure that I got, um, what, what do I say, um, the intended results that I want in, in my research. So you have that laser radiation, which currently used for the medical clinical purposes, uh, military, commercial applications. Um, basically, laser light is everywhere, even the barcode scanner, 
you you can get it um i mean like anywhere even the lecturers when they're teaching also they use a laser pointer and i did use the laser pointer for my research as well and i can even get a result from there because laser pointer is one of the uh, we call it a low level laser and then it has like um, a wide range from the far infrared and then you have like a near infrared with the visible range and also the ultraviolet so um the one that the reason why I said that the wavelength is very important is also determine how hazardous the laser is towards your eye. Because later on, we are going to talk about LASIK, right? So even choosing which laser to use for cutting, which laser to use for removing the tattoos, which laser to use for dermatologies. So all of that have a reason. And it depends on the laser spectrum and how um, the energy deposited at each of the area and the absorption of the laser itself. So you will see that carbon dioxide, the wavelength is about 10,600. So this is the longest one. And then you have, um, okay, for my research mainly, I use a visible laser, 405, uh, which is red, and I did use 532. I have, I have a friend that I tried with the yellow laser, 589 nanometer. So basically the, my laser is actually at this area and I have 808 nanometer as well, which is a near infrared over here. So you can see that um, it's not easy to produce. I mean, like, didn't mean that when you found, discover a ruby and then you can just simply produce all sorts of wavelength with this one. So from that, you will actually need, it could be that it's needed a gas to produce a certain wavelength. You maybe need a certain um, crystals to actually produce a certain wavelength. So it will determine um, what kind of the, the medium that you use to actually get the specific wavelength that you want in, in in uh, getting the specific wavelength of the laser that you want. So this is determines, uh, sorry, this is actually like the types of laser that we have. And the popular one is a helium neon laser. We have NDR laser um, also in, in my lab, I'm sorry, in, my, in our lab, not in my lab, but basically the lab is, is the, I'm the one in charge. So just in case you want to see how the laser looks like, you can just um, drop by to medical physics lab. We have all sorts of laser inside that. Um, we have a carbon dioxide laser as well. So we identify, um, I mean, like you can see that a Zymo laser will actually produce at uh, ultraviolet, carbon dioxide will actually produce at the um, far infrared. So all of this will, will um, determine what kind of lasers that you have. How about the wavelength of spotlight versus normal light? Spotlight, what, what is a spotlight? Uh, sorry, is, is that the one that you use in the stadium? That one is using LED, right? I think the spotlight is using LED. So LED, um, the thing is, you can actually get a single wavelength from the LED, but it's not um, um, it's not in phase. So like laser, you will actually will have a single line. For the LED, will actually still uh, diverge. So that's a difference from, from them. So LED is not the same as laser. It's, it's, it's still different, and and in terms of energy also. Laser will actually have, um, yeah, LED is not polymated. So um, basically, um, what I was about to say. Okay, basically for the laser itself, we'll actually have a high power laser because it's actually amplified, you amplify the light. But for the LED, most of the time, um, it's not as high or as powerful um, as laser in terms of energy. So this is a classes of laser. So um, we determine the, the hazards of the laser based on the class. So you have class one, which is very low power and safe to view. So meaning like if you bring the laser to your eyes, so basically it, it will not cause um, much things to your eyes. That's how we call it a low power laser and also safe to view. And you have one, sorry, class one M, which is low power, but hazardous when viewed direct for the longer than 1000 seconds. So this one, um, so basically, laser light please do not shine to your directly to your eyes. But the thing is, um, when you are talking about the hazardous, so if it's actually shine one thousand seconds, it will actually cause um, a little bit of um, hazardous. For the class two, so low power hazardous when viewed directly for longer than zero point two five seconds. So as you can see, that from one thousand second now it reduced to zero point two five second. So for this one, means like. Um, the laser power is actually a bit higher compared to the class 1M. So of course you should not stare into the beam. You have 2M, which is a medium power and non-hazardous when viewed directly for less than 0.25 um, seconds. 
So again, you should not stare into the beams, right? Uh, and then you have the class 3A, which is medium power, about 0 0.5 um, watt. And this one is very hazardous when you actually view it directly. Of course, we have to avoid um, direct eye exposure. And you have class 3B, medium power also, 0 0.5 watt, are hazardous when viewed um, directly. Okay, my research mainly use um, class 3B and below. If you have a laser that classifies class 4, it's actually a high power laser, which produces ocular skin and also fire hazards. So if, if from 3B and below, even if let's say that you shine the laser light to your hand, um, will actually, um, how do I say, it, it will not cause, you, you will still feel like some heating, but it's not as much as when you use like a one watt laser. Because the laser can use for cutting, even cutting the metals. So you will actually um, determine if you use a high power laser. So even if you shine, when you shine to your hands, of course it will actually cause some um, damage to your hands. But um, 3B and below, at least we'll say that, um, for 2M and, and 1, if you shine to your hands, like when you are using a pointer and you just shine to your hands and nothing happened, I mean, you didn't really feel like the heat unless you shine it for a longer time. But um, for the class 4, even in shorter time, you will actually can cause you some burn um, to your skin. Okay, now we are talking about the interaction of the, the laser with the tissue. So how you determine um, which kind of laser to use and what power of laser, how long is the duration. So it depends on um, the one that you are looking for. So if let's say that you want to have, um, most of the time, if you use like the hot power laser over here, um, over a shorter period of time, you will actually produce um, the plasma induced um, ablation. You kind of like ionize um, the tissues. And then you have also the photochemical um, mechanical direction, sorry. And then you have also the photo um, ablations over here. So mainly when you actually use for surgery, when you are cutting, um, it's actually a photo um, ablations over here. And then you also have the, um, what we call it, the phototomal interactions. So basically um, when the laser is absorbed in the system, so it will actually produce certain heat. So you get interactions coming from the thermals that produced. Um, basically, this one is um, whenever the atoms actually uh, absorb the photons, right, the energy coming from there, and when it decays, it will actually produce a little bit of heat. So this kind of heat actually produces some of the interactions in cells. And then you have um, a photochemical interactions where it does not involve any heat at all. So as you can see over here, the, the density of the laser is very low. However, in order for you to have this kind of interaction, so you need to have like a longer time, a little bit of longer time. Because if you, you actually um, shine it for too low, so you will not get any effects. So most of the time we go by the biphasic dose response curve, where you try to determine what is the threshold. Um, if you give it like too low, it will not cause any effects. If you give it too much, you will actually cause a damage. So it's always that you have to find an optimum um, power density and optimum exposure time for you to get a respective um, results that you are looking for. Okay, um, this is the terms that we're actually discussing about uh, laser light interactions. You have a biostimulation. My research mainly work with this biostimulation. So you absorb the photons and then induce a photochemical reaction. So there will be no um, thermal issues over there. Um, and mainly like most of the time, uh, okay, basically my research is using a blood for a sample and also cells. So as you know that blood is very sensitive. So if you use like a very high power laser and then shine onto the blood, you will see that the blood started to crenate. Um, crenate shape is like, okay, if let's say that you have, this is a normal shape of your cells, right? So when you give the light, um, too much of light or too much of laser light, so we'll actually looks like this. So this is shapes we call it accrenated. So you you're sh sort of like shrinking like that. So this is the things that it doesn't want in your um, in your cells. So when you use for therapy, you want to make sure that you give a positive effects while maintaining the shapes of um, the the cells. So this is what you want. So it leads to the positive stimulation. And you have another one which is called a bio in inhibition, which is a phototermal. So this one uses a mechanism of photon energy conversion in laser medicine as heating. So 
as as it names over here the thermal. So you actually use the laser to produce a little bit of the thermals. And then um, our proteins is very sensitive, about 40 degrees Celsius. You can already cause a sorry, denaturation of the protein. So that's why when you are having a fever and then you detect your temperature is more than 40, so doctor will actually have to inject you with some medication to actually lower your um, fevers because your body cannot actually withstand uh, more than 40 um, degrees Celsius because our body is made of the protein. So this is used for the cancer application where you try to kill uh, the cancer cells. So of course, in order for you to kill it, you don't want the laser light to actually act as a body stimulation or else you will actually kind of like promoting the cells to proliferate more, like you kind of like regenerating a more um, cells. You don't want that because it's a cancer cell. So you want to kill the cell. So because of that, you need the thermals that produced by the laser to actually kill the cancer. So I've used both. Um, but mainly my research is used for the biostimulation, for bioinhibition, I just started actually. And we also have a photodynamic therapy. So this one, you actually have that mediator, um, like an exonous chromophores. So chromophores is actually kind of like, um, um, how do I say it? Like a molecules actually absorb light. So it, it's, it's at a photosensitizer. So you will make that, um, you will actually make, the medium will become more sensitive to light as you shine the laser. So this is what mainly used to activate the drugs. So um, I did not go into the photodynamic therapy because I did not use um, any medium uh, that used for a photosensitizer. But um, this photodynamic therapy is also a um, well-known method that used um, in medicine, actually. I believe that most of you didn't know all of this because um, in Malaysia, uh, we rarely use laser for a treatment except for beautician, um, like for the dermatologist, right, for the LASIK, but we did not actually use uh, much for other things. Okay, I will talk a little bit about low-level laser. How do you classify the low-level laser? So while many types of therapeutic lasers we use around the world, um, so it was not until 2002 that class 3B lasers gained the FDA approvals. So most of the time we'll actually uh, rely um, at the FDAs that use um, the laser that kind of like allow the class 3B to be used as a therapeutic lasers. So these lasers are commonly referred to as cold laser or low level laser therapy. So cold laser because it did not produce the thermal effects and it is used for the therapeutic. And it is limited to only 500 milliwatts. So basically like 0 0.5 watts. It's not even one watt, it's just like 0 0.5 uh, watts. And it considered effective in the treatment of superficial condition. So basically the terms of cold laser refers um, to the lack of heating effect on the tissue cultures in the lead experiment. So basically you will not actually get um, the effect caused by the thermals come from the laser. So this is how we classify the low level laser. Let's see the mechanism of the low level laser itself. Okay, the first thing when you shine a laser on the cells, because I'm talking about the therapy, so basically I will be on your cells. So basically you, when you shine your, your, your laser on your own body, so there'll be, um, how do I say, um, a chromophores on, uh, in, in, in your body are going to absorb and then probably a mitochondria. So mitochondria is actually a power force uh, in your body. So how do you get energies in your body to make all the cellulars and um, working is actually come for the mitochondria. So mitochondria is very important in your body because it's actually the one that producing an, an energy. So as the light actually enters the cells mitochondria, so you'll be absorbed by the um, uh, chromophores, which is including the protein, we call it um, cytochrome C oxidase, which actually then increase its activity. So from here, we will actually increase the ATP. So ATP is um, adenosine triphosphate, which is the name of your energy produced by the mitochondria. So basically it's a main energy source for the majority of the cellular function. So your, fun your cellular cannot function without the ATP. Most of the cellular will need ATP in your body. So basically how the laser causes the therapy in your tissues is because it's increased the amounts of energy in your body in the forms of ATP. And it will increase the cell's ability to fight infection, um, accelerating of the healing processes, like um, renewal of the cells. So that's how it actually work. And then the modulation of the ROIs are going to activate the transcription factors that positively impacting cellular repair and healing. 
So this one is actually the oxidative um, stress. So this one are going to actually take in of victim. So the laser are able to actually uh, modulate this to repair and to enhance um, the repair mechanism in your cells. And then you have also the release of nitric acid, sorry, nitric um, oxide, a potent uh, vasodilator, which is increased the uh, uh, circulation, decreased inflammation. So basically, if you, you are in ICU, right, so you will actually inhale this um, nitric oxide if you cannot actually breathe on your own. So it's kind of enhanced the transportation of the oxygen and immune cells throughout the tissue. So this is what the laser can do to your cells. So as a result from all of this, um, you will actually affect it positively on the cells, provided that you use um, correct laser light, which is a vent line, correct um, exposure time, and also correct um, output power. So you have to make sure that the dose are given to the cells are optimum and cause a biostimulation, not a bioinhibition. Um, I'm not so sure if you really understand what I'm talking about. Uh, do you have any questions so far about the mechanism itself? So this is basically how the low-level laser um, work in terms of giving a positive effect to the cells. So that's what you use in dermatology. Um, because if let's say that you have a scar, so how the laser actually was able to reduce the scars on, on your skin. So basically the laser are going to remove all the damage of the cells and then initiate the um, healing process or like a renewing of the new cells. So that's how you get the laser fade from your um, skin. Okay, this is a laser absorption. So mainly when I want to use, um, or I want to choose a laser, I have to see that which cells, sorry, the cells actually absorb which wavelength. So you can actually use a UV spectroscopy to actually get the reading. Um, so for the blood, for myself, I use the blood. So you can see that blood um, absorb most um, actually at the UV area over here and also a little bit of the green. So that's the reason why I use um, 532 in my research when I irradiate um, the blood. So as you can see that your um, H2O, which is the water, is actually absorbed more in the um, far infrared. The mel melatonin, which is on your skin. So can laser treatment be used on heart attack? Um, no, it's not actually used in heart attack. Uh, I don't really understand how do you mean by the heart attack. It's just like, um, how do you say, it can produce. Okay, uh, I actually did read a paper how they, you know how the COVID-19 patient actually will cause a patient to be suffocated, right? You cannot really breathe. So what they do is they shine laser at the chest area. So from that, you can actually get um, the, the blood flows very well and then like how the oxygen will be transported um, better. In, in my research also, because I read it on, my, on the blood itself, I will discover that the laser was able to reduce the viscosity of the uh, blood. So that's why if you say that those having like, um, when you say a heart attack before the heart attack itself, like you know how, um, like the clogging of the arteries and then the, the blood has become very viscose, like you have, um, so when, when, you, when the viscosity is higher, so the blood flow will be uh, slower, right? So because of that, you will actually have um, problem with breathing and, and stuff. So what the laser can do is, when you shine the laser on, on the, the blood itself, it was able to, um, what we call it, uh, uh, when the, the blood most of the time will actually close back together. That's why you make the blood become very viscose, especially if you are smoking. Because um, I've actually has tested for those that actually smoke. You can see that the blood are very um, viscose. So, uh, but after I irradiated the laser, you can see that the blood now, instead of like uh, packing together, I, I forgot what is the terms that we use. Let me, it's like this, it looks like this like uh, packing together. So this is how the one, when when the blood is actually like um, attached together, okay, aggregation, sorry, aggregate together. Now I got this. So when, when the blood is actually kind of like have the kind of aggregation, so it will actually, um, how do I say, make the flows very slow and decrease the flows of the blood. So as you know that, what is the blood function? The blood basically is the one that transport all the nutrients, all the oxygen. So anything that you can find in the body can be found in the blood. So that's also the reason why whenever the doctor tried to discover um, what kind of illness that you have, the doctor will actually do the blood test. 
Because whatever you discover in the body will actually discover in the blood because the blood is a transporter. So what the laser do is you can actually kind of like separate this and, and reduce the amount of aggregation. So that's how the blood flows now can become better and then like maybe reduce um, how the, the clogging that can happen in your uh, body. So this is actually widely used. We call it intravenous. I think I have, yeah, this one. So we call it intravascular laser therapy that improves. And even there is like a research saying that um, you can even use this for if let's say that you have a depression. So some of the people say that you can regenerate your cells because when you're having certain, um, how do they say, regulating in, in your bodies. So it's also related to how the blood flows in the body. That's how I really love that the Chinese medicine where you are talking about the energies, right? The energy didn't flow. So the laser was able to actually make push up the, the, the flows of the body, sort of. So this is how we have, um, and this is also the acupuncture using if you just know something from the movie they just use like a long needles right but the modern acupuncture that even comes together with the context of of, um, of the acupuncture itself so you can see that um the speed and these actually the laser needle acupuncture system and it used for the muscle injuries because it was able to actually um have in the healing so that's why you can use this so most of the athletes actually use this as well together with the sonography things with the ultrasound. Laser treatment can be used for corn or what treatment or any excess tissues. If you want to cut that things, yeah, it can be used. Because the laser have a low level laser, low level laser, and you have also high power laser. In terms of a cut, I think I'll get it, let me see. Um, okay, I'll get to that later on. Um, this is basically how the low-level laser therapy in the body will actually can improve your blood circulations, um, epitheliums, where how your um, your your skins actually can uh, renew the muscles in the bone, neuron, and even people's actually stimulate brains if you have Alzheimer's so like neurological disorders. So the laser was able to actually um, sort of like stimulate your own brain, um, connective tissue. So it can actually, uh, honestly, to me, was actually doing this kind of research. I found that it's very, it's wonderful things. It's just that in Malaysia, uh, there is not many people that invented in this kind of, of research. Okay, now, um, I believe that most of this kind of application you haven't heard in Malaysia, <laughs> but uh, when I'm talking about high power laser, you can see that this kind of laser that can cut the metals. Um, yeah, someone is about to ask a question. So how come this kind of laser can be used in medicine? Any guess? You can see that high power laser are powerful and can even cut a metal like this, but can be used in medicine. How do we do that? Any guess? I believe that some of you have learned laser application as well before, subject. Any guess? How we can use this hypothesis in, in, in medicine? You know, I, I'm not talking about application, but how do we use this? You know that um, if it can cut metal, it can just simply cut throughout your bone, right? Cut through your bone. So how is actually, how do you actually adjust the laser to be suitable to be used in medicine? Short-sighted inspiration. That one is application. I just want, okay, I did not get my, my question. What I'm trying to say is this laser is very high powerful, right? Imagine that if it can cut into the metals, but if let's say that you said that you want to use for surgery like cutting, it's not just cut your abdomen, it can even cut through your ribs and your vertebra because of the high power laser. But how did we use this high power laser? in that kind of application in medicine. Low density of laser, right? Um, low density. Okay, basically, we did not really use a low density. It still used high power laser. But what we do is we made it into cows. This low level laser is mostly like using a continuous, uh, continuous wave. 
where like a laser pointer as you shine it so it will keep on um like emitting laser it, it sorry it keep on emitting light right but with high power laser in order for you to use in uh, medicine you have to make it into a pulse so instead of like continuously emitting like this so you get into a pulse so i like we stop emitting however this stop is very fast not even nano not even pico now we even have femtosecond which is very short so because of of um this the path is very short so you can actually um how to say uh, most of the time you will see that it looks like a continuous wave but it's actually have a pulse because it's very short your eyes cannot catch um the pulse that they have in between over here so that's how we use a high power laser in um therapy so you made it into a pulse applying protective gel needed um yes we can apply but if you use this kind of laser and if with a continuous wave what kind of gel that you put in your body and able to protect you so you made it into a pulse okay all right so the first one which is very famous is the methodology you use it for the hair removals uh, for the acne for the scar so this one is most of the time they use a carbon dioxide laser co2 and also ndr laser um, which is CO2 is a gas laser and the laser is um, a solid state laser. So um, if you actually watch the videos, how they do, you will see that there is like um, a sounds like a bang, bang, bang. So that one is actually a part of the laser. So there'll be like one in, in between. So it's very short, like bang, 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 bang. You will, you will hear that. And then most of the time, you, of course, you will put something to actually numb the skin first before you actually perform this kind of, of procedures. Because um, it is very high power laser, it's still painful actually. But because you numb the area and then put like cooling gel so that you do not cause like um, a local heating at that area. So that's how you apply it um, in dermatology. So they use a high power laser. But the one maybe cells using a UV light, the one is actually using a low uh, laser. But um, the one that we use in the clinics, most of it is actually high power laser. But not their highlight, maybe about 3 watts not up to 30 watts basically the one i use for the metals up to 30 watts so the dermatologist usually like use up to 3 watts and you're moving a tattoo as well um at first do, do you want to guess how we remove a laser sorry how we remove a tattoo using a laser um because if if you just like a normal ink of course after you put um maybe after after several days or after several months, it will just like um, go on like that, right? But if you actually um, do the tattoo, a like permanent tattoo, it will actually stay almost forever. But the laser was able to remove this tattoo. Burn away the cell that is died. You mean you burn the, the skin cells? You mean you burn the skin cells? What else? um no you did not burn the skin cell if you burn the skin cells what happened is um how do i say um you are going to make this area burn but you didn't see it's burn right there is no burning over here laser in disintegrated tattoo materials yes that's correct so what you use for the ink is actually basically a metals so in your body when you actually like um how do we call it injected you call it injected because you put kind of like a small needle to make this kind of shapes of the tattoo right so when you do that um you kind of like and it's actually made of metals uh, and your body will detect that as the foreign materials however um your red blood sorry your white blood cell which is in charge of the immune system are not able to remove it so that's why it stays there but what the laser do is without damaging the the, the the epidemic area okay this is a very interesting thing about laser remember about the spectrum that i told you just now so there is only like certain melatonin your skin will absorb only certain um, laser light while the other did not absorb certain light so you use um, different laser at a certain wavelength that are not really absorbing by the skin but absorb that can actually penetrate directly at the ink so what they do is kind of like is it, this is a bigger sorry this is a bigger size so you kind of like chunk it like um, you're chunking it so until it actually becomes small and then after that your own um immune your own web cells are going to actually bring this out of the body 
So bring it to the kidney, process, and then light goes out. So that's how they do it. And this one is for the surgery. You can see that this one is a carbon dioxide laser incision to actually cut um, the abdomen open. So as you can see that over here, the most interesting part about laser is, because it's high pop laser, so when you cut open, so it's kind of like sealed um, the blood vessels. So you will not see any uh, blood coming out from, from, the, uh, from the vessels. Because as you cut open, of course, there'll be a lot of vessels, right? So if you use like normal knife, so you will, you will see there is a blood. But when you use um, laser over here, so the, the laser are going to sort of like seal the vessels. So there'll be no blood coming out from there. All right, now we get into the topic itself, which is the LASIK. But before we get into the LASIK, um, what is the time now? Time to go. Um, let's see the eye anatomy first. Because as you know, that LASIK is used for the eye surgery. But before you get into how we do the surgery of the eye, let's first see how the anatomy of um, the eyes first. So you can see that there is, um, you have like your own cornea over here, and then you have your lens, iris, and then the retina. So the most important when you're talking about um, LASIK is, you at least have to know about the retina, your own cornea, and the lens itself over here. So basically, how do you actually see? Because um, if let's say like, there is a light coming out, so you will actually have the lens is actually are going to um, bring the image at the um, retina. So you basically kind of like having a focus. So if you did not have any sort of like myopia or what we call it another one, like far farsightedness or nearsightedness problem, basically if you your eyes is just fine. So the image will actually fall directly on your retina. So that's how you see. And in fact, um, the image that you see is actually supposed to be um, upside down, but um, there will be a nerve impulses that sent to the brain for the inter interpretation that are going to correct the image. So that's how you see, instead of you see the upside down tree over here, it will be just like a normal tree. So, so basically, if it's normal eye without any problem, so it will actually fall directly on the retina, so the focus, right? But what happens to our eyes if you have like myopia, which is nearsighted, meaning like um, you can see the object near, but you cannot see the object far away, so we call it myopia. So the image is actually formed before the retina. So you see that the retina is over here, but you can see that the image actually formed before the retina. So that's why you can only see the, the things that near, but you cannot see the things from far. Another one we have is the hyperopia over here. So the image basically um, formed behind the retina. So basically kind of like a focus. There is a problem with the focus um, of your eyes. So when it falls over here, you can see the things that far, but you cannot see the things actually near. Because it's, it's a bit far from your retina. So this is a problem that you have. And how do we normally correct our vision? How do we normally correct our vision? If you cannot see, if you have, if you suffer from myopia or what the terms in now, hyperopia, how do we normally correct our vision so that you can see clearly? Yes, you wear glass or contact lens, right? So basically the glasses or contact lens correct the vision because they allow the eyes to actually focus at the spot of the retina. So this part are going to produce the clearest image. So kind of like compensate the refractive index so that it falls directly at the retina. Then you can see clearly. So this is how you do. So if you actually like nearsighted, which is um, myopia just now, so you correct it using um, a convex. So if you actually have the sighted, you use a, a concave. So you have, this is how you correct. So this is how your glass do, right? Now, when it comes into LASIK, so what is LASIK? So LASIK is laser, same for laser, in situ, which is on-site, keratomeliosis. So this is actually um, the Greek word terms for the cornea and to cuff. And for the LASIK, we use a zymo laser. Again, because of the wavelength, did not absorb by the lens, because you didn't want to damage your lens. So basically, when you get the laser into your eyes, it will just go directly on the retina. It will not actually go to the um, what the lens 
So that's why sometimes when the laser shine to your eyes, you will see that the outer the outer uh, layer of your eyes is just fine, but um, the laser falls directly on your retina that causes blindness. So you don't want that to happen. So that's why Zyma laser was used for laser. So basically, you kind of like carving your own cornea on the side. That's why we call it in situ, which is on the side using a laser. But before we get into LASIK, um, there is actually um, the LASIK will say I would say that it comes from this man um, called Barakur. So his first prior leg to mill the underside of his septic disc of anterior corneal tissue. So what he do basically is during the surgery, he will actually flap open your, um, your flap and then he will take out your cornea and then kind of sort of like frozen it. And then after it frozen, it will actually cut, kind of like sharpen uh, your cornea using a normal carving. And in the paper that I've read about this one is, the hospital at the time with the apparatus that he designed is about three kilometers away. So during the, the, the surgery, they will, he will actually take up the, the cornea, frozen it, and then bring to the, the place where his apparatus are, and then carving the cornea based on a certain formula that you can see over here, and then bring it back and then put it back on the patient's eye. So that's how they do it in the old days. So that, that term's called the cura, curatomeliosis, before we have the laser in situ. So this one basically, they just like carving your cornea um, frozen. And then when we have a laser, the reason why we call it in situ is because you didn't take out the cornea, you didn't frozen it and then carve it. So you just use the laser directly on the eyes using uh, Azima lasers actually produce um, one, Nine three, which is ultraviolet beam, and a pulse laser, um, pico or femtosecond, and it uses a photoablation technique. The reason why I say laser is a high power laser is because you want to have a photoablation, which is are not able to produce by low level laser. So you have to use a high power laser, which evaporate the organic tissue without heating the surrounding eye tissue. And the project, the procedure actually took even less than a minute, um, sometimes even like maybe 30 seconds. So it's very, it's very fast. You can see that over here, this is a flapping wool taking out. How they do it is actually first, we'll actually put like a drop uh, to numb your eyes because you, of course you, you don't want to let, um, you feel pain. So they will actually numb your eyes and they will open using this kind of apparatus, like open your eyes. And they will actually create a flap open up um, on top because you didn't want this to get burnt the laser so you open it and then the laser we call it laser sculpting basically you kind of like sharpen the cornea instead of like with the with the glass what you do is you you sort of like um what uh, use a certain lens that actually can correct the refractive index so that you can see clearly but with this lasik it correct directly on your cornea. So if you, if the if your eyes will need that certain carving, if it's too bulgy, you will actually just make it that uh, flatten a bit more. If it's actually like too um, curved, so you will actually like cut at the edges so that it's become a little bit more um, uh, bulgy over here, so that you can have um, the image falls directly on your retina. So that's how they do it. After the procedure is done. So we'll reposition back the flag. And then um, they even, you don't even need a stitches because the laser um, very, like we call it um, non-invasive. So it's, you don't even need like um, any switches at your um, eyes. So that's how they do the LASIK surgery. So basically you cut, you're carving on the cornea itself. So that's how we call it in situ. So you're carving your own cornea. But the reset come from the LASIK is, um, honestly, not everyone suitable to do the LASIK. The doctor are going to actually check whether you fulfill a certain criteria of the LASIK. Um, of course, you shouldn't have uh, like a diabetic or any problem with the wound healing, because if that's happened, you are not able to recover from the surgery that you actually done with the laser just now. And um, there is like a risk that comes with the procedure as well. Some patients might lose vision if, let's say, that during the procedure, 
um, the laser light uses two powerful and then like simply get into the retinas and then yeah you, you sort of like lost your vision and some people even develop like um, the uh, ventilating visual system kind of like blurry you can't really see well because um the carving are not doing very well so you will still see that the image did not fall directly on the retina so you will still see some problems uh, with the visions some patients may develop severe dry eye syndrome. Um, your eyes is actually a bit teary because you need that kind of, of, of tear to make sure that your vision is well. Um, but with this kind of surgery, it can actually develop a severe uh, dry eye syndrome that can even cause like, not even cracking. Cracking, is it? Like, because sometimes even if your skin are too dry, you can see like a little bit cracking on your fingers. It can happen to your um, eyes as well. And for some far-sighted patients, the result may diminish with age. Um, so even though you have corrected like, at the young age, we don't even need um, the, the, the glass anymore, but if your age is actually um, increasing, so the, the anatomy of the eye is also um, changing. So because of that, even though you have carving your own cornea just now, so you will still need um, some correction using a glass. And they said that long-term data are not available because these techniques are very new. So that's why um, some people are still thinking whether they should go for LASI or not. And as you do it, um, I mean, like it's not like a contact lens that you're using or a glass that you're using because it's something that is the outer. But with the LASIK, you're carving directly on the cornea. So if something happened during the carving with the laser, so it will actually um, cause something that you can undo. And with this one, how they do a sculpture is actually because of photo ablation. So you kind of like carving. So you will just like carve at this area, whether you want it to be more flattened or if you want to have like a little bit of curve over here, so you just cut at the edge here to make sure that the image can fall directly on the retina. So that's the LASIK. astigmatism. Um, I've actually read a paper when I'm doing this kind of, of um, presentation. They said that lazy can cure, but I'm not really sure how they do it. Um, I forgot to, to get into the asthma, uh, astigmatism. Okay, um, I think I remember how they do it. So they basically like um, at the one of the eyes, they may be corrected. One having like a little bit more longer, um, sorry, the image falls a little bit more than the retina and another one will have like before the retina so that's how they corrected um, the, the procedures they're still doing the same thing they're still carving but they make like one eyes will be a little bit behind um, the retina appear behind the retina another one will be appear in front of the retina if not in second so that's how uh, they correct your image so basically it's like correcting um, your vision Um, that's all from me, actually, from the LASIK. Any any other question about the laser that you are interested to know? Um, honestly, uh, I'm not saying that I'm, how do I say, an expert in this kind of, of um, things, especially using a high-power laser, but I'm just sharing whatever I know um, from my research. <laughs>